It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Yes, welcome to the After Show. It's day one of the Telcos and Public Cloud Summit, and we are live on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of two live Q&A shows. We have our final programme for you tomorrow at exactly the same time. We started our Telcos and Public Cloud Summit today with a panel discussion on the best use cases for Telco and Public Cloud partnerships. Now, we've already received a number of questions from you on this topic, and all of our panellists are back to help answer them during this live show. And if you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now using the Q&A form on the website below the video player. There's also a poll question. It's nice and simple, so go ahead and cast your vote now, and we'll look at the results later in the show. As always, your co-host for the after show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director here at Telecom TV. Ray, as well as the panel discussion today, you also spoke with Ahmed El Sayed of Vodafone on its Techco transformation. Yeah, that's right, Guy. I had a really great chat with Ahmed, who is Vodafone UK's CIO and Director of Digital Engineering in Europe at Vodafone. And we talked about a number of topics related to the operator's plans to become a tech co, courtesy of transformed IT operations and a more build it, not buy it approach. And we talked about the role of public cloud as part of Vodafone's hybrid cloud strategy. And he really called out scalability as a key feature when deciding which applications to run on public cloud platforms. I would definitely recommend people checking out what Ahmed had to say. It was a really good interview. Yeah, absolutely, it certainly was. Although personally, I'm still not sold on the term Techco, but I am open to persuasion. Right, on with the show. So let's now meet our guests who are eager to help with all your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are Francesca Cerevalli, Emerging Technology Director at Colt Technology, Paul Breton, Principal Product Manager, Azure for Operators at Microsoft, Beth Cohen, SDN Product Strategies at Verizon, Rani Haby, CTO Networking, Edge, IoT and Access at the Linux Foundation, and Grant Lenahan, Partner and Principal Analyst with Apple Door Research. Hello everyone, it's very good to see you all again. Now we've got a lot of audience questions to get through as usual, so let's get going. Ray, have you got our first question please? Guy, yes I do, and uh, this first question we're gonna to put to Francesca first to get the ball rolling. And the question is, is it possible to align a telco's internal cloud requirements with the external cloud services requested by enterprise customers? So uh, in other words, can there be a single cloud strategy within a telco or does it need to be a split approach, uh, you know, a, a different cloud for the telco operations, a different one for the customers? Uh, Francesca, what do you think here? Uh, thanks, Ray. Uh, great question. Um, I think it's very difficult to really harmonize the cloud strategy because external and internal requirements are different. And actually, to, to say more, even internally, we have different requirements depending on the business unit. So our IT, for example, is looking at partnering with cloud providers to execute the data strategy remove the fragmentation that we have in the data across the entire organization to remove silo, silos and enable better collaboration. Then the operational team and the IT are also looking to transform the OSS and BSS into cloud native to become a, a digital service providers. And finally, the innovation team, which is um, part of, is looking to establish synergy with cloud providers to innovate the business model for solution for verticals. So even internally, we have different requirements and different decision makers. If we look at customer requests, that they're really looking to, for solution stack to enable uh, digital transformation. 
And even if we're seeing different, uh, you know, diversify the requirement in terms of SLA across the different verticals, retail, uh, manufacturing, uh, offices and smart building, eventually in terms of capability, they all need the, the, the same stack, intelligent connectivity, uh, distributed cloud, IoT platform, AI platform and smart application. And then the way we cater for all those diversified requirements is uh, through really distributed infrastructure and uh, an edge to enable distributed topology. So my opinion is that it's really difficult to harmonize the two requirements and have uh, a single uh, cloud strategy for uh, customer demand for our own uh, digital transformation and our own uh, internal initiatives. Okay, interesting. Thanks, Francesca. And of course, it, it's just as well then that there are multiple cloud platforms available for telcos and enterprises to be using. Uh, Beth, let's come to, to you now and find out uh, your thoughts on this question. Well, I, I'd like to build on what Francesca said, and, and I don't think it's even possible to have a single cloud strategy for both our enterprise customers and our mid-market customers for that matter, and our own internal needs. For one thing, our enterprise and mid-market customers tend to have multi-cloud strategies. Uh, we also have run into issues related to uh, something that's in the U.S. called Kalia, uh, which is um, access, um, you know, as a telco, you know, we're a regulated industry, so we're required to um, provide access to law enforcement, uh, which obviously is not, um, you know, we cannot let our enterprise customers, you know, be under that um, requirement. So, um, you know, our solution uh, is that our enterprise customers provide their own clouds. Uh, we, we then get access to them, you know, to provide the services. Um, so, so it's, that's clearly orthogonal to the idea that there's a single cloud um, that can be provided. <clears throat> so, and generally, um, the, the, the way we use the clouds are different, uh, you know, for internal use and for our customer facing uses. So I would say pretty emphatically, um, it really needs to be a separate strategy. Okay, great. Thanks, Beth. Great insights there from the US market. Uh, and Paul, I think you wanted to come in on this question as well. Yes, thanks, Ray. Um, and uh, just to make things interesting, I'll have a slightly alternative view to Beth and Francesca. Um, given that the uh, topic of today's summit is telcos and public cloud, then um, unsurprisingly, as telcos move more towards using public cloud for their own internal needs, um, then there's also potential to uh, leverage that same strategy and resell um, the public cloud as an enterprise solution. Um, in practice, though, I think what we'll really see is a specialization of different cloud requirements based on where people are trying to uh, place payloads uh, within the network. So there can be some payloads, be they IT um, or enterprise applications that fit very well in highly centralized you know, uh, data centers like public cloud and where all the you know, public cloud providers have very highly segregated solutions there to solve some of the issues Beth mentioned. Uh, but then as you go out into near edge and far edge, there may be more specialized technical requirements that come out of the um, particular needs to run, say, RAN payloads. So you're going to see all of those maybe based more on the nature of the payloads, uh, but still from one overarching strategy that uh, can fit with the uh, public cloud going forwards. Um, but it'd be interesting. Um, there'll be lots of different solutions and different uh, strategies adopted by different operators. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yes, there are so many uh, permutations to, to cover off, of course. Uh, OK, excellent. Great answers to that opening question. I think uh, now we can move on to Guy for our second audience question of the day. Yep. Thank you, Ray. Uh, and, and Paul, I think I'd like to just start this second question straight back with you, actually, because it links into what you've been talking about with, with the edge. And, and the questioner is asking, will new telco and public cloud partnerships result in a rethink of telco edge strategies? 
because telcos have spent too long on vague external edge use cases that just never come together in a meaningful way. Perhaps what is needed is the presence of the hyperscalers. Well, that's our audience question. Uh, Paul, what do you think? Do you think this, uh, this might result in a, in a rethink of strategies? Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, thank you for that, Guy. Um, I think what we'll see is multiple uh, strategies here because um, there, well, again, will be um, different use cases that apply in different scenarios. Um, so there will be, um, in fact, there already are um, some edge clouds, um, such as AODS from Azure, but there are other solutions as well, um, that are highly optimized towards the technical requirements of running network payloads, you know, very high packet throughput and so on, um, that the telco needs for their own resources. Um, so those will appear as part of an edge strategy. By edge, I mean not in public cloud centralized data centers, but potentially on the operator's own premises. Um, but I'll call that a near edge strategy. Um, combined with that in potentially the same locations or nearby to the same locations, there will be potential um, public mech. It's a novel use case um, where the um, telcos are, I think, highly interested um, for obvious reasons in exploiting the um, application ISV ecosystem that the hyperscalers have access to um, in order to bring novel applications to that edge, uh, you know, within so many milliseconds of the end user, wh whatever um, the particular requirement is. And you'll see that uh, driven, um, you know, alongside the network payloads, not necessarily exactly the same platform. Um, uh, you may even see multiple sets of uh, edge compute happening there within different operators, depending on what the applications are that they're trying to run. Um, and then you've got the far edge strategy, be that for ORAN um, or other cloud RAN type scenarios, or the um, uh, potential private MEC use cases, that's real on enterprise premises, uh, things like uh, private 5G networks, private uh, routing and other applications that may be run in an industrial setting. Um, so all of those are possible, again, with potentially slightly different technical solutions in each case, but all of those are available from um, the public cloud as managed services nowadays um, to make it easier to adopt and scale for the telcos um, because building and operating and maintaining all those different platforms is a really hard problem. The fleet-wide management across it is what the hyperscalers specialize in. So yeah, um, I think it was a really good question. Thank you for whoever sent that in. Um, and uh, it, 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 the opportunities there for novel um, business cases, um, novel different payload utilizations um, across the operators uh, are really um, very exciting coming up in the, uh, the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you very much for those insights, Paul. Uh, yeah, you know, this this topic of the cloud and impacting on, on telco edge strategies, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more of that next month at our DSP Leaders World Forum event as well. Uh, Francesca, you'd like to come in and, and comment on this viewer question? Uh, uh, yes, um, I think it's important that telco keep uh, reviewing and maybe even redefining uh, the, the edge strategy. We have done so. Uh, at court, we have uh, an on-premise edge and a network edge. But uh, since, uh, you know, as the business model, the use cases and the demand get better shaped for edge enabled application, we have also included in our strategy what we call it partner edge, where basically instead of positioning our own edge, we work either with, uh, you know, the SI, the, the hyperscaler, and we use the, the edge the edge capability of our partners while we offer co-location and, uh, and intelligent connectivity. And that, I think, it enables really to increase the footprint, but also to cater for uh, diversified, uh, different use case and diversified requirements. Oh, that's very interesting. Thanks for those comments, Francesca. Uh, well, in that case, Ray, I think we might be done with this question. So over to you for our next one. Thanks very much, Guy. And uh, Beth, we're going to come to you first with uh, this next audience question. Uh, and the question is, um, we have huge problems keeping on top of public cloud costs and fees. It's difficult to provision the right resource. Are telcos going to have to accept over-provisioning 
uh, of resources and accept the resulting higher than necessary fees. So uh, this is a real question about the, the cost of using the public cloud and just how flexible these, uh, these pricing and payment models are. Beth, any insights at all on this? <laughs> that is a really, really tough question. Um, because of course, telcos work on efficiency, and uh, you know, and and hyperscalers work on the elasticity model. You know, the efficiency is gained by the elasticity of of being able to consume only the resources that you need. However, most telco workloads tend to be very stable, uh, which means that we don't have that that big wide swings. Of, of use that where we can gain the efficiencies of uh, the capacity, you know, the capacity elasticity. So um, that, you know, we, we are very careful about what applications we do move into the public cloud uh, to make sure that they are cost effective. Because, you know, the reality is, is that it isn't necessary, because we're large enough, it isn't necessarily less expensive for us to run our own data centers um, and our own cloud instances, which in fact we do. Uh, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, it really needs to be a hybrid approach where we gain that efficiency, uh, where, where we're using uh, applications that are elastic um, and put them in the cloud and, 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 you know, it's really a very, it's very individual based on each application, whether it makes sense to put it in the public cloud or, or continue maintaining our own private infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> also relates to where we're delivering the service. Uh, public clouds tend to be concentrated in the large cities, the large metro regions, uh, which is great for servicing the large metro regions. It's not so great for the for the down down market that as uh, I think uh, um, Paul mentioned uh, the the uh, the telco edge. Uh, so I would say in the end of the day, uh, we we are going to we are um, using a hybrid approach to use you know to to uh, to solve that problem. Yes, and I, I think this is what we tend to hear from from operators in general. Uh, that it's a hybrid for everything. And I, I guess in the next couple of years, we'll start to see, uh, you know, patterns emerge and maybe new uh, usage and, and payment models uh, emerging alongside those patterns as well. So it's still very early days, of course, for the relationship between the, the, the telcos and the hyperscalers. Okay, thanks very much, Beth, uh, for your answer to that. Um, and I think, Guy, I'm going to hand over to you for the next part of the program. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, well, it's time now to check in, as promised, on our audience poll for our Telcos and Public Cloud Summit. One question, five multiple choice answers, and as always, I'm afraid you can only pick one. And the question we are asking you all this week is, what is the main barrier to successful telco and hyperscaler partnerships? And you can see the current real-time voting right here. There's a few areas here we've already touched on in this program. And it does look like Telco's fear of losing control of key technology and markets is, um, well, it's, it's taking the lead by quite some way. Uh, and, and costs, as we've just been talking about there, hidden costs and vendor lock-in uh, is coming in at second. But it's early days on the poll. And if you have yet to vote, then please do so. The more votes, the better. And we're keeping the polls open and we'll take a final look at the results in tomorrow's live after show. Okay, so back to our Q&A and we are about looking at the clock 25 minutes into the program now. So we still have time to answer a few more of your questions. So please do keep them coming. Ray, over to you for our next one. Okay, thanks, Guy. And interesting to see that poll result there. It changed uh, from just before the, the program started as well. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so this next question, we're going to start with, uh, with you, Rani, for this one. And the question is, <clears throat> where is the public cloud innovation focused? Uh, where might the hyperscalers and the open source developer community take us next? 
and how might this benefit telcos? So I think you know, this is a, a really important question, a key question for, for the telcos, because they want to know what benefits they can get from the public cloud player. So uh, Rani, what's your view here? What can the public cloud uh, companies deliver in terms of innovation in specific areas? Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, I, I agree, it's a great question. And uh, just less than two weeks ago, uh, Google announced a new project called Nephew, where uh, it's one example of such innovation where Google Cloud is bringing uh, their tried and true technologies from uh, cloud scaling and applying that to managing and orchestrating cloud network functions. Uh, this project is called Nephew and it was just launched by Google, but immediately uh, many other uh, players and including telcos uh, joined that and uh, have announced their support for that. So that's one great example of how Google, who know uh, a thing or two about cloud scaling and know a thing or two about Kubernetes, uh, put all that together and brought together something that offers real advantage for telco use cases in, in, term, in terms of managing and orchestrating cloud network functions. So I think um, that's one great example. Uh, we have other examples where another project called Magma, where um, Facebook or Meta, <laughs> to be precise, um, take took a chance at implementing um, um, packet court. First, uh, it was 4G. Now it's moving to 5G. Uh, but it's really they're bringing a different, slightly different uh, approach to things and trying to once again use some of the lessons they learned um, from their uh, applications and, and hyperscaled applications and apply that to mobile packet core. So we're seeing these kind of uh, the best of both worlds using uh, technologies and approaches that were proven in the uh, hyperscale or public cloud domain being applied to telco. Now, to keep it kind of uh, even, I think there will be also innovation from the other side where um, I think telcos will lead, would lead and uh, hyperscalers and cloud providers will join. Um, I'm sensing that uh, maybe open run will be one of the areas where that will happen. Uh, so the open run or ORAN standards have been open for a while, but now there are emerging projects in open source software that implement those standards. Um, currently, uh, we see kind of uh, telco uh, equipment vendors and telcos taking the lead on that. But I expect that soon we will see hyperscalers and cloud providers uh, joining these projects and getting a chance to um, get their uh, feet wet in, in actual uh, RAN networks, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Can totally see that happening. And uh, as time goes on, of course, more and more specific applications for lots of different verticals uh, coming out of the, the hyperscalers. Uh, Beth, we'll come to you next and then uh, and then to Paul. So, uh, Beth, what's your view? Where, where's the innovation happening from the hyperscalers for, for the telco community? Um, well, I think I think there's been a lot of uh, work in the uh, with within the hyperscalers, uh, but I think more importantly at the and the open source community, because um, I think that's where the real innovation really needs to happen. Uh, Randy mentioned a number of projects. I'm involved in the Anikit project, uh, which is a uh, creating reference models, reference architectures, and reference um, uh, uh, reference configurations for telco workloads, um, uh, so cloud native te telco workloads. We have two work streams, one for virtual machine type workloads because many of the network workloads have not been converted to uh, container-based or Kubernetes yet uh, for a variety of reasons. Kuber Kubernetes um, ha still is working on some, adding some features that make it more uh, telco friendly. I know that's another work stream that the community has been working on. The CNCF is, is uh, you know, has a whole telco working group that's focused on on adding features and functions to make it uh, easier for telco workloads to be built. 
Um, and so all of this, all of these things are all happening within the, the open source communities, uh, you know, the GSMA, uh, LFN, um, Etsy, uh, MEF, you know, all of these organizations are working on various aspects of supporting telco workloads on a virtualized infrastructure and cloud native uh, telco workloads. So I, I think that's where the real innovation is going to be happening um, because that that's the place that the telcos and the vendors that are providing these services can really work together. Um, so I'm very excited to be part of that community. Um, and, uh, you know, I am looking forward to, to more uh, in adoption within the telco community. Telcos, as everybody knows, tend to be pretty conservative on this stuff. Um, and, you know, they are absolutely using cloud. I mean, we've been using cloud for a long time. Uh, but, you know, we're just starting to use cloud, you know, referencing some of the earlier questions. Uh, we're just starting to use cloud, the public cloud for our own internal operations. Uh, so I really see that the open source community is really where the, the everybody's interests can be met. Okay, great. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, and lots of good work obviously been going on for years there. And I'm sure all of these elements, the public cloud, the open source community, the telcos, you know, all of that work will come together uh, and uh, and really start to, to, to move things on. Uh, and Paul, let's come to you. Uh, I get the sense that uh, that Rani's mention of the of the the core capabilities uh, might have prompted you to, to want to come in here. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, actually, I was going to um, riff off a couple of different topics that both uh, Beth and Rani mentioned. Um, I think one of the key areas that the hyperscalers can bring real innovation to the telco is actually in the area of efficient operations. Um, I like to call it fleet management. That can be of the cloud itself or of the applications running on the cloud. They both have a, um, a large scaling problem um, in both those areas um, that make them difficult to do efficiency. Um, so, for example, um, we're you know into a decade now, near, nearly a decade since an NFE was launched, um, and a lot of operators, as a result of that, built their own private clouds. Um, but managing private clouds um, has proven to be really quite hard work. Um, tends to be a lot of quite large operations teams there. So, whether it's done through the open source community or whether it's done through managed services. Um, I think the public cloud hyperscalers will be able to bring some of the efficiency and very high level automation that we use to run those clouds um, cost effectively into the benefit of the telco. Um, and that will be, I think, uh, one of the key areas of innovation, in addition to some of the deep technical issues that uh, Beth mentioned around making sure that the cloud itself has the low level requirements that are needed to manage the packet volumes and the bytes per second that uh, needed to be sent uh, through telco payloads. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Combination of open source and uh, the hyperscaler community. But I think there'll be um, space for both DIY assemblies of open source projects, as well as um, potentially people who are more interested in a managed service approach to that. OK, great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, a great point there about uh, uh, automated processes. Absolutely something the telcos are looking for. Uh, and Francesca, you wanted to come in on this as well. Yes, uh, thanks, Ray. Yeah, I mean, as most of uh, the panelists just uh, uh, just uh, um, stated, it's really important. I think there are lots of benefits that the upper can bring in terms of innovating our network, for sure, uh, through, for example, the marketplace of containerized network function that are uh, building up innovating the operation through their orchestration capability, but also innovating business model. And a court, this is where we are uh, focusing most uh, as we are going towards a solution business model. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're working with IBM where we bring the NAVI, the network edge, the customer edge, 
and then uh, IBM brings the cloud satellite, which is a distributed uh, cloud platform. Uh, and then we can leverage either we, we enable a platform business model where, you know, the uh, the application or brought in the use cases are brought to by the by the enterprise customers or we'll build up some specific use case using, uh, you know, the AI platform for cloud providers, whether it's uh, IoT telemetry, visual inspection or uh, digital supply chains. Um, so, yes. Okay, great examples there. Thanks, Francesca. Um, okay, all right. Well, I think uh, time to move on to uh, our next audience question. So back over to you, Guy. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. Some great answers there. Uh, Grant, we've got a question here we'd uh, like to put to you first. The question reads as follows. Are different parts of a telco's business pursuing different types of partnerships with public cloud companies? And might we see a telco work with various cloud companies and not just a single one? We have touched on this slightly earlier, Grant, but you know, what do you, what do you think in, in terms of you know, the, the telco being comprised of different units, each one pursuing it, its own partnerships? I'd like to start with, uh, I think, two reasonably well-known quotes to sort of set the stage. One is that form follows function, and a second is that strategy follows uh, structure, uh, you know, from Alfred Chandler and from the, the world of industrial design. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think a lot of the, uh, the the panelists have already hit on some of the fundamentals here of, of the structure uh, that we're dealing with and of the functions uh, that we are supporting because they're very, very different in telcos. Uh, if you think about how a telco views the world, it is a network that connects up data processing centers or as we move forward in, in technology clouds. And if you look at the way hyperscale and more and more enterprise in general is viewing it, they see data centers that have these lines between them that are telecom. And yet we're trying to employ the very same technology because there are so many great ideas about self-management and scalability and stochastic multiplexing in, in cloud native that can be applied to network functions, to IT workloads, to games, to anything that you want. And the reality is telcos have very different relationships with their customers that use all of these, right? At, at the very base, you've got um, the network that we're trying to move from dedicated hardware to much more modern self-managing scalable hardware and software and public cloud is a great way to do that. But as has been pointed out by people who are even closer to it than I am, that means you've got to have a focus on packet processing and very low latency and absolute reliability because there are so many different uh, and in some cases unknown applications that are dependent on that. At the far end of, of the spectrum, you've got uh, telcos serving a, an entirely new opportunity that has come about because in part of public cloud, which is the incredible distribution of work locations and data centers as applications that were once locked in the basement in a few corporate data centers within uh, a, a secured LAN perimeter are moved out into public cloud um, often multiple public clouds, and telcos now are faced with both the challenge of how do I interconnect them, how do I secure this end-to-end, -end, but also the growth opportunity that there is a lot more interconnection to go on and a lot more complex security chains to administer. And this, you know, we've got covered in our research pretty extensively, is a big opportunity that's driving a lot of, I think, what will ultimately be good change. But then there are third relationships, if you want, or functions that bring uh, hyperscalers and telcos together. Uh, for example, you know, telcos have wanted to bring cloud storage, cloud computing as services to their clients, either uh, their enterprise clients primarily, either uh, you know, as part of Mac or just as, as, as a cloud service that they do secure and guarantee. So you've got all of these different perspectives. And then now we're seeing yet a, a fourth relationship emerge as everything from smart cities to the fourth industrial revolution is driving applications that are actually not probably led by either an enterprise or public sector customer, 
or by the telco, but in many cases by specialist integration firms, the, the Rockwell automations of the world and the Robert Bosch's of the world that view the telecom network and some of the um, near and mid edge compute capabilities as necessary plumbing support. But the end goal is robotics, automation, uh, efficiency, direct monitoring, better security. And so I think this drives almost to the answer that, of course, you're going to have many different partnership models between telcos and, and cloud. There are going to be different SLA requirements, different geographic distribution requirements, different channels to market, different companies that are facing is prime the opportunity. And so the simple answer is yes. Um, and I actually think we already heard some of the really driving factors um, in particular, not, not to slight anyone else, but in particular from Paul and, and Beth's answers that got into some of the underlying uh, why of that. And we're seeing everything from uh, uh, telcos having relationships to integrate to public cloud where their enterprise workloads are, to telcos having relationships with cloud providers to resell those services to their customers. And then we're seeing a lot of experimentation today in a whether the public cloud can be a good platform for network core network uh, workloads and even some RAN workloads, um, and we're seeing experimentation there from working with to effectively buying and installing uh, 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 public cloud technology uh, to direct partnerships like we've seen between uh, Microsoft Azure and uh, AT and T for for exa example. And I think uh, out of those experimentations, we'll see new models come along that will hopefully solve some of the you know unique technical and geographic problems that telecom has um, that maybe some other industries don't. Thank you for that, Grant. As you say, a complex set of requirements leads to a you know, wide range of, of different types of partnerships. Um, Randy, we'll come to you in a second. But first of all, Beth, let's come to you for some thoughts on this question too. Uh, so I think this this question you know ties into some of the earlier comments and uh, that were made about um, you know the complexity of these relationships and I think it's important to to understand that you know telcos do serve many uh, customers uh, so our enterprise customers are already multi cloud so I, I some very large percentage of our our enterprise customers you know buy services from us to connect to Microsoft Azure, Amazon, uh, Google, you know, whatever. Um, and, and, and we're seeing that's driving a lot of services into the cloud, um, or rather su the support of services into the cloud because they want private access. Um, but we're also seeing a shift in how the network workloads go through the go through the network. So, for example, you know when the, the great work from home experiment that we have just lived through for the last two years, uh, we saw you know tremendous changes in how the networks, you know, where the traffic was coming from, it was much more distributed and where the traffic was going, uh, which was, it was much more centralized. So it became a far more of a hub and spoke uh, model than it had been previously. Um, and, and, you know, that's obviously affecting, you know, how the telcos consume cloud services and how our customers can include uh, consume cloud services. And, and of course, also there's the overlay, you know, at the end of the day, our customers don't think, oh, wow, the network's working great. That's not how they think about things. What they think about is, hey, this is, this is a fantastic, you know, experience with, with using my, you know, ITSM system, you know, is very responsive or, you know, my, my video content, uh, you know, is, is not glitchy. That's how they think of the experience. And, and, and it's important for the telcos to understand that perspective that for the most part, the end users, you know, the, t the, the network component is just a piece that they don't even think about. Uh, so, you know, again, it's the complexity of making sure everything all works together and the cloud component and, you know, and cloud 
hyperscalers bring, you know, some expertise in development and in developing, you know, in supporting platforms for development that, you know, the telcos are just not very good at. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the telcos are really good at getting networks out there, out all the way out to the edge, wherever the users actually are. And the hyperscalers, you know, that's not their forte. So it really needs to be a partnership. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Beth. Uh, and Rani, let's cross across over to you for your thoughts on this question. Yeah, so because the business models are maybe still in, in flux or we may end up in uh, multiple business models coexisting even for the same telco, it's really important to have a uniform as possible technology stack because otherwise uh, it will be difficult to switch between business models and uh, it's going to be difficult to retrain the personnel and um, develop, the, adapt the operational methods. So I think uh, what we're trying to do in the open source communities is to make sure our technology stacks can run on any platform, whether it's on-prem, whether it's AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud. And this way we are keeping this um, uh level of freedom for the telcos to determine where they want to run their workloads and even I'm seeing from different uh, uh, telcos that they're trying to make sure that everything runs smoothly both on-prem and on public cloud and they can smoothly transition between them and keep a hybrid model. So I think uh, what we're seeing in open source project is that it's really important to uh, strive for this uh, unified technology stack, uh, no matter what the business model ends being. Yeah, so that's a tough job, Ronnie, and uh, I'm pleased that there's a lot of people, uh, you know, striving to, to work towards that because it's um, yeah, a very, very valuable addition there. Um, well, I think we might be done with this question, Ray. So uh, let, me, uh, let me hand over to you because I think we've probably got time for at least one more question today. Okay, uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, and so uh, this question, this is to uh, all of our speakers today. So looking for uh, volunteers to take this question on first. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, if telcos switch multiple operations to the public cloud, what happens to the operations teams? Are they needed anymore? So this is that, uh, I guess, that, that long-standing, this long-standing question about uh, as uh, working patterns within the telcos uh, uh, shift and some applications uh, get uh, switched across to public cloud platforms, what does this mean for the, the telco application team? So uh, does uh, anybody want to step in and, uh, and give a, um, uh, to get the ball rolling? Grant, thank you. Um, I'd like to actually start, start with an even simpler question. Uh, if cloud native technology is successfully implemented, will operations teams look like they did five years ago? And I think the goal of every operator on the planet is to make sure the answer to that question is no. We want to have better productivity. We want to have higher availability. We want to have more self-management. Now, whether or that happens within the telco's walls or whether that happens in a public cloud partner or whether it happens in a hybrid distributed environment that's worked out between the telco and one or three public cloud providers, um, I think really shouldn't make too much difference so long as uh, the solution is achieving a very high level of automation. Right, high level of self-management, a high level of self-scaling, a high level of self-reporting. Um, I think the real question is what are operations jobs gonna look like? They're not gonna be turning wrenches and plugging in plugs and restarting things. And hopefully they're not gonna be working at the command line. I think they're going to be understanding streams of, of data that comes in, understanding what is normal and what is not normal along with machine learning that can do the same thing and beginning to put uh, automation in place uh, that can address that. Um, this is one of the things, by the way, Paul uh, hit on uh, quite subtly um, earlier, is that these are actions which are, in many cases, I think best done by large organizations and can scale and be just, you know, utilized by many uh, operators. So that is something where I think public cloud can bring some methods, procedures, scale, write it once and use it many times to the industry. Uh, yet 
On the other hand, the telcos have a great deal of experience and expertise in how telco workloads work, fail, and someone at the end of the day needs to look at the end-to-end network. And you are never going to take a piece of glass, a concrete foundation, a metal tower, a radio, a, a drop to a building, a drop to a home, and put it in the cloud. It needs to be where it is. So there is always going to be the end-to-end service and that customer experience that Beth just talked about that needs to be assured. So I I think telco operations staff should uh, not be terribly worried about uh, things, you know, going poorly for them. They just have what could be a pretty exciting new future to look forward to. That's my two cents. Absolutely. Thanks, Grant. Uh, And Beth, let's come to you next. So, so I've already seen operations uh, staff go through uh, one revolution, which is the revolution from the appliance-based model, i.e. the traditional sort of appliance routers to a virtualized model um, and, and adopting cloud and the hardware and software disaggregation. So, so I'm already seeing operations become more efficient and become more um, agile, if you will. Uh, Another thing is um, they are also, um, you know, we're already highly automated. So, you know, driving additional automation is in our DNA. And um, I've, I'm seeing that many of our operations folks are, are, you know, moving toward a, what's called a net dev model, i.e., you know, it's, it, they're driving the automation. They're building the automation. They're they're using the AI tools. You know, AI tools are only as good as um, the the users who can interpret the results. Uh, you know, we're just starting down that path toward intelligent networks. Um, I don't see self running networks anytime. Uh, you know, past what we're already doing. Uh, you know, taking a great leap forward any time in the next couple of years. Um, because, you know, AI takes a long time to develop. I'll use the example of, uh, this comes from my past. I was involved in the speech recognition industry, uh, which for years and years was hoping and betting on using AI and, and neural nets to, to, to solve the, the problem. Uh, at the end of the day, it turned out the, the problem had to be solved using what we called the brute force model, which is we just collected literally thousands of hours of speech and ran it, you know, ran it through and came out with the with the proper algorithms to make it work. I think that's what's going to happen with networks as well, and that's happening. It's starting, but it's going to take a while to work through. All of this means that the operations staff don't have to worry. As long as they're staying up with technology, learning new things, which any operations person should be anyhow uh, doing, uh, they, they uh, you know, we still need them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Uh, thanks, Beth. And uh, that, that's good news for those operations teams. And of course, we already see lots of retraining programs. Uh, going on, uh, particularly in some of the larger operators. Uh, Paul, let's come to you next, and then we'll come to Rani and uh, finally Francesca. So, uh, Paul, let's come to you. Thank you. I'm going to use an analogy um, and uh, agree with both what Grant and Beth said. But what my analogy is um, probably most of us nowadays have a dishwasher at home. Um, that took away some of the drudge work. Um, and I now can spend more time cooking more adventurous dishes. That's what I like doing in the kitchen. I don't like doing the dishes. Um, So in the same way in the telco world, what the operations team will be freed up to do is move up the value chain. Um, That might be um, that they spend more time um, being able to look at uh, security, um, you know, all the things that are happening, say, in Ukraine, um, and the potential implications there, they could be looking um, at those sorts of issues in a lot more detail than they have time for today. Um, equally, every operator has a unique market that they operate in and the, uh, the exact um, customer preferences, what matters to customer experience um, needs to be measured for that market. So again, the operations teams can move uh, into spending more time driving business value 
um, and uh, uh, opportunity for the customers of the uh, respective telcos rather than running things like software upgrades in maintenance windows at 3 a.m., which, let's face it, is fairly boring. OK, thanks, Paul. We, we know to come to you when we get around to our comms cooking programming. Uh, we know to, to come to you to, to find out what you're, what you're doing these days with your adventurous recipes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and Rani, let's come to you. Do the operations teams have anything to worry about? Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say. I think we've been uh, freaking out operations teams for a few years now, telling them they all need to be uh, software developers. Now Beth alluded to maybe they all need to be data scientists. So I um, wanted to... Uh, convey a slightly optimistic message. What I'm recently starting to see is that the approach is changing uh, and we're seeing emerging things like intent-based networking, where um, the technology is moving towards simplifying things for the DevOps or operations team. So you don't have to be a highly skilled programmer or uh, deal with very complex YAML files and, and edit them on the fly. And I think um, there is hope for a more um, operator friendly technologies that will make the lives of these uh, operations teams actually easier and not require them to develop new skills. Of course, there should be some transition towards um, adopting the new technology, but it doesn't mean that every operation uh, person now needs to have a degree in computer science or data science. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a really great point. Um, uh, yeah, there's certain levels of retraining, but like you say, not everybody is going to become uh, you know, a programmer in multiple languages and new technologies. Uh, and Francesca, we'll come to you for uh, the last comment on this. Thank you. Yes, operation team will be very much needed. There will be a shift in their uh, daily task because as we introduce AI and automation into the FCAPs, obviously the operation team, they don't need to worry to identify a fault or a security incident or a misconfiguration or to optimize a certain, uh, you know, a certain KPI or certain parameters, but they will need, we need them really to be able to interpret those uh, actionable insights that comes through those, you know, through those uh, AI dashboard um, and be able to advise um, whether it's, you know, capacity forecast or predictive maintenance or any other use cases. So yes, I think uh, they will need to become digitally enabled, but uh, there, there will, we will need them. Um, um, there will be a shift in the daily task, but uh, it's important that operational team uh, uh, is, is, is part of the organization, of course. Absolutely. Thanks, Francesca. So the overall message there is uh, less washing up, but more use of herbs and spices in the operations teams of the telcos. Very good news and uh, almost time for an afternoon snack. So at this point, Guy, I'll hand back over to you. Oh, <laughs> that's what I like to hear. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, and thank you, everyone, because we are now well and truly out of time. It's time to get back into the kitchen. Thank you so much to all of our guests who joined us for this live program today and to our audience for sending in their questions. And we'll be back tomorrow with another live after show program. Yeah, absolutely. And do remember to send in your questions for the after show as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. And don't forget the poll question either. There's still time for you to have your say. So vote now. Yes, vote now. And please join Ray and me again tomorrow for the final live after show for this year's summit on telcos and public cloud. Meanwhile, we're going to leave you with a sneak peek at what we have in store for you next month. Goodbye for now. Put those PowerPoint slides down and actually talk about what we need to do to move ourselves into the DSP arena. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience.